And yeah, hang, hang around. Hang if around, can. yeah. And what do we got next? Uh, the news. Should we do news? Okay. Yeah, let's do the news quickly. So um, no Tony today. No Tony. Thank you, Body. Appreciate Thank you, Body. it. We'll Thanks, talk. guys. Talk to you later. All righty. Well, I have to do my little news segment thing. So hold on. Go ahead. And now for our weekly news segment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll try to make this faster oh than, than Tony's normal news news flow. Centralized mining pools are delaying Monero transactions confirmations by 60 seconds. This was an interesting post. Um, I believe it was, yeah, Rucknium had done a study and he uh, basically looked into the uh, mining pools and saw that there was a 60 second delay that was happening for confirmation versus P2 pool. I don't completely understand why. And when I read it, I don't think there really was a conclusion uh, as to exactly why it's happening. Uh, but clearly, there's there's something that can be done to solve this. And we'd want to solve this uh, so that essentially the network keeps up with its pace of trying to you know produce a block every two minutes. Uh, interesting in reading it that you you know you realize that P two pool. Uh, uh, you know, effectively is, is making more more money in terms of fees because they are confirming more blocks. Uh, I think it was something equated to like seventy extra XMR in fees over the course of a year. I could be wrong in that, but it was interesting to to see that stat. Uh, next story: Cake Wallet, the five year journey. So, uh, Vic, it looks like Vic sat down with a glass of wine, or maybe, <laughs> maybe just some uh, all, uh, other uh, uh, substance, and uh, you know, uh, pour, poured out his heart. Happy he, five uh, years! Happy five years! Congrats, Vic! Congrats to the Cake <laughs> team, awesome. and yeah. obviously to Vic. I mean, we love it. Vic uh, started, it was a one-man show. Vic started this off. Uh, he goes into detail of how everything started. We spoke about it quite a bit on the show. I was actually part of, part of the story uh, when Vic had first launched Cake Wallet on iOS. Uh, it was the first iOS Monero wallet. And I, he, in his posting, he had made some kind of comment that led me to believe that he was New York-based. <laughs> so I reached out to him. I was like, "Hey, man, let's let's get a beer. You're you know you're the guy that created a wallet. I want to meet you. Like if I'm about to store my Monero on this thing, what better way to to, to meet it the person <laughs> than to meet the guy? It, yeah. So uh, we we met up. We met up in uh, Soho. We went out for so a drink. We went out to a bar over there. We we spent like a whole night. It was great. And we uh, we've been we've been great friends ever since. And. Uh, you know, the most impressive, I've always said this, the most impressive thing about Cake Wallet and Vic uh, is that he really grew uh, with the community and really listened to community feedback the entire time. Yes. Like me meeting up with him, what well, that was community feedback. He was like, yeah, sure, let's meet. This is like he had like literally just posted the thing. And we sat and I told him what I think. Oh, you got to, you know, you got to make it open source. This is what, you know. Vic, Vic goes into all that. He didn't even know, like, understand the concept of open source, really, that, like, you know, that they meant, like, that the app itself would be, like, open source and anybody could come and copy it. Because, he, you know, he wasn't he wasn't in this world. He was, um, Vic is a steel guy. He would work on tech projects, fun tech projects on the side. And this was just one of his additional fun projects on the side that obviously grew into, you know, essentially a full time thing. But I think, yeah, what's what's been most impressive about Cake and Vic is their ability to listen to community feedback at all times and evolve the app towards the direction of community consensus. And that's why I think they've become the strongest wallet in the community uh because there's really no way to compete with that so he's 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 not obviously you know it's it's a profitable business obviously you know it's capitalism they're profit driven uh but they're really uh you know their 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 moral compass seems to align most with what the community desires and it makes good business sense um but not always, right? There's things he could do that probably would have been more profitable, but he decided not to do it because he wanted to uh, stay aligned with the community values. So once again, big congrats Woo! to Vic. We're, we're always proud to uh, you know have you as our sponsor. We appreciate everything you've done for us as well. Yes, yeah, definitely. Like keeping, this sh keeping this show going, sponsoring us, sponsoring the conferences, all that stuff. 
So um, we thank you. Okay? And yeah, and cake congrats, Vic. We love cake wallet. <laughs> Not surprised you made it to five years. So we'll, we'll see what the next five years brings. That's the other thing too. Is Vic is like you know he's not he's not small minded, right? No, he's like not, he, he doesn't stop. He he's a going. man who is building an empire, and we are very fortunate to have him on Team Monero. Um, next post: the Human Society, which I'm uh, born. Uh, oh, the Humane Society. So somebody posted that they're a member of the Humane Society uh in i think it was like san francisco i'm not sure uh but they now accept monero that he got the, he got his <laughs> local humane society to accept monero that was cool it was kind of funny they also accept clam coin so i guess clam so, coin somebody I, I over that. at the humane the society that's coin a clam too. coin bag holder that got the humane society to accept uh, monero and clam coin for donations <laughs> so uh if you've been looking to unload your clam coins now is the time <laughs> <laughs> Maybe take a, a, a tax deduction for your for your donation <laughs> there for your loss. Um, uh, an incomplete guide to stealth addresses. The next story. This, so this was posted by uh, this is uh, what's his name from from ETH Vitalik. So this is on Vitalik's blog, and uh, he's discussing possibly adding stealth addresses to Ethereum. So talking about how you know. Uh, we need, you know, Ethereum needs to have privacy essentially built into it on the protocol level because it's, you know, trying to not only is it trying to be money, but, you know, every people are using it for all sorts of things. So uh, interesting to see that, you know, um, or not. I mean, obviously, this is inevitable, right? So th there's there's great value in privacy. We all here in Monero know that privacy needs to be built into the protocol level. Uh, other projects are waking up to it. Will they be able to do it? I don't know. Uh, even Ethereum, it's an interesting read talking about stealth addresses as uh, ideally being something they could add and that there is a path forward, but talking about all the potential issues that it may create, it's not as straightforward. Uh, you know, it's like trying to build build your parachute after you jumped out of the plane, uh, as opposed to Monero, which is focused on getting privacy right first on the protocol level. And then we'll start with all the other fun stuff uh, that these other projects are doing, maybe on on second levels or, or or other ways of doing it with the Monero protocol. So interesting to see those developments take place. Another story, uh, the next actually three stories are CBD related. Um, so Tanzania is cautious about adopting CBDCs. Uh, so this is an interesting article, throws out some stats. The outcome of the research at this point revealed that more than 100 countries in the world are at different stages of CBDC adoption, with 88 at the research stage, 20 at proof of concept, and 13 at pilot. So, I mean, we, we talk about quite a bit on the show. I need to do a good Monero talk with you know an expert that's really following the day-to-day -day with CBDCs. I know there's actually a really good uh, link out there that shows um, the current CBDC development around the world and, and stat. I uh, would love to get that guy who created that website on. We could talk about it. It's it's uh, you know all around the world, it's happening. It's happening in tandem. Countries are at different stages. Some companies are taking steps forward. Some countries are taking steps back, realizing it may not be you know time for them. Tanzania appears to be one of those countries that's kind of taking a step backwards uh, in terms of CBDC development uh, in that uh, basically they're saying uh, cautious and risk-based approach. I guess it, they just feel that it's too risky for them at this time to move forward. So interesting development in the CBDC world. Um, CBDC is next article. CBDC is not worth the cost and risks as former BOE advisor. So similar, so similar story, uh, but coming from somewhere else. Central banks worldwide are pushing forward with digital asset projects despite the various crypto industry implosions of the past 12 months. China has rolled out its central bank digital cur currency to several cities and made it available for use at the Winter Olympics. Many other central banks, including the Bank of England, are considering how to roll out a CBDC, while not Nigeria's CBDC has had poor uptake so far. India has already launched a pilot scheme, while Mexico has confirmed the launch of the digital peso. However, Tony Yates, former senior advisor of the Bank of England, advises against CBDCs in a recently published opinion piece of the Financial Times. According to Yates, the huge undertaking of digital currencies is not worth the costs and risks. So this is interesting. So we're starting to see uh, this dynamic uh, 
play out where, you know, uh, it's becoming political, right? Uh, there's people chiming in. Some people are saying we need to proceed with CBDCs faster. Some are saying we got to put on the brakes. Uh, some countries, you know, uh, running out ahead. Other countries kind of pacing themselves, seeing what, what goes wrong first before they proceed. And so it's it's all very exciting. I mean, what we do know is CBDCs are coming. They are 100% coming in some form. You know, uh, they're already launched. Uh, you know, in some countries, not to any great success, really. I think kind of maybe the biggest news so far in CBDCs was that the launch in Nigeria uh, was quote unquote you know, kind of a, a failed launch is my understanding. I mean, I, I guess it's still very new, um, but we, you know, it wasn't what I guess people feared, right? Is that overnight, everybody would start using these things. But I think it's way too soon to claim that that's not going to be the case. Uh, we know how governments work. They, they boil frogs, right? They slowly turn up the heat uh, and they have all the resources and all the time in the world to do so. Uh, so that's the way these things are going to happen in slow, moderate steps as they ratchet things up and then never ratchet them back down. Uh, and uh, so Nigeria, maybe at the get go, it wasn't strong adoption, but who knows? You know, maybe in a year from now, it's going to be like, uh, you know, if you want to get your, your tax return dollars from the Nigerian government, you're going to have to, you're going to receive it in CBDC form. So little things like that, governments are going to use to slowly onboard everything. Uh, and the next the next story is also CBDC related. The Digital Dollar Project urges U.S. to take action on CBDC development. So this is uh, you know home in the in the U.S. The Digital Dollar Project is actually interesting. So it's, it's you know it's not uh, government. It's not a government run project. It's privately financed. Uh, I'd like to maybe do a story on this as well. I'm not sure who's behind it. I think Ripple might even be kind of involved in partially funding this. There's also the Hamilton project, which is, I think, being run by MIT and uh, the bank in Boston, um, the U.S. Treasury Bank in Boston. But, uh, you know, that that is a government funded project. Digital dollar project is is privately funded and they're obviously pushing towards CBDCs. And so they're, you know, doing this study and then I guess they're going to use their influence to try to get the government to slowly push towards CBDCs. And I guess they have their, you know, their, their reasons as to why they're, they're pushing in this direction. So follow the money, uh, look to see who's behind the digital dollar project, who's funding it. And you could probably figure out uh, what they have to gain from uh, creating a central bank digital currency here in the U.S. Once again, I think it is inevitable uh, in the U.S. I don't know. Maybe here it might take longer than 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 others because of the 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 way the government works here. It's a democratic republic. It is. It's hard to push things through. Although sometimes it's, things do happen overnight. Right when we get these. These, uh, you know, red flag event, you know, when COVID happens and the next thing you know, they print a trillion dollars overnight. Everybody shows up at Congress and they don't they don't bat an eye and they're all willing to uh, print endless money. So uh, uh, who knows? Maybe we see some event like that, right? Where overnight there's a, a kind of an emergency need to uh, create the U.S. digital dollar CBDC. Uh, and then, bam, there it is. Uh, but yeah, digital dollars project. And one of them, they're they're pushing they're pushing ahead. They're forging ahead. Last story of the day which was going to be the theme of the show but we haven't really mentioned it so we'll mention it now is uh Hal fin Hal Finney's tweet from January 21st 2009 what? so this was shortly after bitcoin was created this was a i believe a week or 10 days after Hal Finney first tweeted that he's running the bitcoin client so that's obviously the most famous tweet right is you know it was the first time anybody had even mentioned that they were running the Bitcoin client. Hal Finney, as far as we know, you, you, as our understanding is he was the first one other than Satoshi, unless he is Satoshi, to have been running the client. And he you know, received the first Bitcoin transaction from Satoshi. And no sooner than a week or I think 10 days later, he tweeted this, looking at ways to add more anonymity to Bitcoin. So here in Monero land, uh, we don't necessarily celebrate Hal Finney's first tweet, although it, it is uh, obviously it's a beautiful, great thing when he tweeted that running Bitcoin. Uh, but we're, we're celebrating uh, this tweet where he tweets about the the need for adding anonymity to Bitcoin. So, you know, Hal Finney was most certainly a cypherpunk. I interviewed uh, 
one of the BSV guys the other day. Oh, yeah. and I was surprised by his answer that he said, no, Satoshi was most certainly not a cypherpunk. Well, Hal Finney most certainly was the first user of Bitcoin, one of the first guys developing and moving Bitcoin forward. Hal Finney was, uh, he worked on the PGP project as well. Um, we had Zimmerman at Zimmerman. <laughs> last year, which was amazing. I didn't reach out to him this year. Maybe I'll try him again, but I know like it, it, it would be tough for him probably to get to get to Mexico. But yeah, Hal Finney was 100% a cypherpunk uh, to the core, and he wanted Bitcoin to have privacy and anonymity built into it. And so, you know, there's rumors that maybe he worked on crypto note, whatever. Uh, I have no idea if that's true. Uh, but thank you, Hal Finney. Appl applause hey, don't to put you. It too loud, because then people get deaf. Much, hey. much applause to you. Uh, if <laughs> if you're not Satoshi, maybe you're Nicholas Van Saber. <ah. <laughs> and that concludes and that, the news for the week.